Hello, and thank you for joining today for my conversation with Kylie Reed. She is one of the five 2020 Young Lions Fiction Award finalists. Uh, my name is Vincent Piazza. I am an actor. I'm also a co-chair of the Young Lions Committee. Uh, each year, the New York Public Library's Young Lions Fiction Award champions emerging writers recognizes innovation and excellence in contemporary fiction. This year, the award marks its 20th anniversary of celebrating the next generation of outstanding fiction writers. The 2020 Young Lions Fiction Award finalists include Steph Cha for Your House Will Pay, Julia Phillips for Disappearing Earth, uh, Shuan Juliana Wang for Home Remedies, and Brian Washington for Lot, and of course, Kylie Reed for Such a Fun Age. Um, and you can see the interviews with all of the finalists at nypl.org slash YLFA. So today, I'm with Kylie Reed. Kylie, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yes, no, we're excited to, uh, to have you. Um, first off, of you and yours, you've been safe in all of this. Uh, been very uh, safe. This. Yeah, I mean, I can't believe that this is where, you know, writers can kind of thrive because we're very... I'm used to being inside the house and, and whatnot. And so the fact that we can stay healthy is the most important thing. And we're just happy to have that. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. A buddy of mine is a novelist and um, I called him out of like concern. I said, how are you in all this? He's like, man, I'm thriving. Like I'm like the Jason Bourne of lockdown. He this was like completely, <laughs> yeah, this is like such a good moment to, uh, uh, you know, I guess um, uh, soul search reflect assuming everyone's safe and you and your loved ones are safe. It's a great opportunity to, uh, right um to do what you like to do exactly yeah, yeah this is no different than than the other novel writing processors of staying inside so so as long as we can stay healthy we're good over here if you don't mind if you could tell us uh, a bit about the story absolutely so such a funny age starts in 2015 on a saturday night in september and we meet amira tucker amira is a 25 year old african-american recent graduate from temple university she is in that period in her 20s where she's broke she has a couple different jobs she's making the same crock pot meal like four times a week she doesn't really love her apartment and she's trying to figure out what to do with her life, especially as her health insurance is coming to an end soon as she'll be kicked off her parents' plan. But on this night, she is hanging out with a bunch of friends or having a birthday party until she gets a phone call from Alex Chamberlain. Uh, Amira babysits Alex Chamberlain's three-year-old daughter, Briar. And on this Saturday night, Alex says, please come take our daughter. We've had a family emergency. Can you take her to the grocery store? I'll pay you double. We just need her out of the house. So of course that hearing, I'll pay you double, Amira says, I will be there. She goes and picks up Briar. She takes her to a high-end grocery store and they're having fun. They're in the frozen food aisle. They're dancing to Whitney Houston until a security guard and a customer upon seeing a black woman with a white child accuse Amira of kidnapping the child. It is a very tragically familiar situation where someone pulls out their cell phone and there's a conflict between them until Amira can get Briar, Briar's dad to come and confirm her identity. And from there, it works as a bit of a comedy of good intentions as uh, Alex tries to right the night's wrongs and get to know her babysitter. And it deals with doing the right thing for the wrong reasons. Yeah. Interesting. And now you said it's set in 2015. Over what time period does it cover? Uh, in her life. It covers a four to five month time period, which I'm noticing is like everything I've ever written. That's, that's where I'm at, four to five that's months. Your, that's yeah. your comfort zone, <laughs> yeah. four to five. <laughs> yep. Interesting. And now how long does it take you to put together a story that, that lasts for four to five months? I mean, obviously this is your question. debut novel, um, well, but I'm, I'm curious, yeah. always curious about that. It's the first, it's the first published novel, but it's not the first novel. It's just the first good one is what I like to say, but it's, it's going to be interesting because I, I think I thought about writing it for about a year and then pen to paper was about two and a half years. And then after you sell it, you do more editing with your editor and whatnot. So up to like around three years total. At the same time, I've always had a lot of jobs and I was in graduate school and having multiple part-time jobs to pay for things as I was writing this novel. And so now that I'm writing full time, it'll be interesting to see uh, what the process looks like, but I'm I'm kind of just as obsessed with uh, service and work as I was before, and so it'll be interesting to see how the second one goes. 
Very interesting. And now, uh, and that's, you know, from previous conversations I've had with people, that's actually a pretty, pretty uh, speedy process, like to go three to four years to get to a novel. But yet, for anyone that's a civilian like myself, uh, you know, three to four years of an attention span on a single story is, is kind of remarkable. I mean, what is that like for you? Is, is this something you work on once you, you said you took a year roughly where it was mostly in your head, you were kind of, it was, it was forming, it was a bit amorphous. Right. And then when you started putting the pen to paper or getting on the keyboard, how often were you working on something? That's like a great that? question. So I did like random spurts of like, let me just see what I can get out there probably in the first like three months. But then after I realized that this was something that I wanted to work on longer, at the time I was living in uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas and I was applying to grad school. And then once I knew that I got in for about six months, I would work for three to four hours, Monday through Thursday in the morning. And so that was just the time that I was working on it. But in the beginning too, when you're not really sure if something is going to be something, I always have like one or two other projects that I'm working on. So sometimes I would take some time off and work on a short story, or um, I had a, a writing project that I did for a friend. So in the beginning, it was a little bit start and stop, but then towards the end, especially once I have a body of work, to edit from, I'll work on it for eight to 10 hours a day, for sure. Wow, wow, yeah. wow. So yeah, you just kind of have to splay it out and then you can shape it. Uh, exactly, it yeah. Like so much more fun editing than, than those first <laughs> few months, yeah. I can totally understand. And now, did you find like some of those um those other stories that you would fill in in the meantime or kind of take those, those sharp right or left turns? Um, would they inform? Did you find yourself coming back to your original story with maybe some new insight from, from some of those side projects? Man, no, I wish I did. <laughs> I'm just like, <laughs> you like this other thing better, so you should just work on that. Um, I feel like a lot of what I write has to do about um, work and, and emotional labor and, and money. And so I definitely, I think it's nice to see where your tendencies are. Um, but at the same time, when you're working on a big novel project like that, I think at a certain point, put everything you can into it and just focus on it. Because once you're really deep in those worlds, that's when, you know, when you take a walk, you'll solve something that you don't even um, understand. Yeah. A hundred percent. And do you find that like music helps you unlock some of that or is no. it uh, any other medium and form what you do? Um, that's, this sounds so boring, but I, I use a white noise machine when I write. <laughs> And so That's no music, <laughs> I just turn on a white noise machine. Um, but at the time when I wrote Such a Fun Age, there was a really nice, I was in grad school and there was a really nice gym that we would get membership to. And there was a basketball court and there was like an area like where you could stretch. And I wrote a lot of the novel there, the white noise just really helped me, yeah. Oh, cool, yeah. I guess there's something pure about that where you just, there's nothing, you just kind of moving everything away just to, to see what comes from within. That's really yes. cool. Yeah, I love music. And I think like, I feel like the most common writing process that I have is I write for about an hour and a half and then I go for a walk and listen to music and kind of disassociate a little bit and then I come back and do it all again. Yeah. Right, cool, very cool, very cool. Yeah, and um, obviously what you you told me the, the story is about, the novel is about, um, I mean, here we are, right? I mean, we're in the middle of this global pandemic and it's kind of laid so much of that subject there. Um, how's it been? I mean, you were releasing this novel kind of at the front of this and now we've been in this like three to four month kind of vacuum. Um, uh, uh, how has that been for you? I mean, on a debut novel to have something that's, um, you know, uh, dealing with some of the issues that have been um, brought to light, uh, a bit of a watershed moment. Right. Uh, what's that been like? It's been, I mean, fascinating to say, to say the least. Well, uh, it's when I, when the novel, when my age, my editor put it on submission right before we sold it in that same week, uh, two black men in Philadelphia had the cops call them because they were sitting in a Starbucks and someone did not believe that they could be just sitting in a Starbucks, like normal human behavior. Um, and so it's, tragic to see how relevant these things still are. And when I started writing the novel, I was really intrigued at the trauma and lasting effects that even these tiny little domestic instances can have of where someone accuses you of something and, and there's no violence. But with the violence in the past few months, it's so heartbreaking to see that, that 
that's where that can lead to. And so obviously that's been really heartbreaking. At the same time, um, you know, I have to say, I, the book came out in, on New Year's Eve 2019. And so I still got three weeks of book tour, which was so lovely and touching to be with people. And it's really nice when people say, oh, I thought she left her baby at home or this part made me scream. And all of those things mean a lot as well. It's interesting right now as, as our country deals with so much inequality that I do notice that there's a tendency for people to say, oh, I'm going to pick this book up because I want to learn something. And I have to say never in my, in my time writing it was I like, I'm going to teach people things. I'm a storyteller and that's it. And so, of course, I love when books leave a lasting impression on me, but I really also hope that people can just focus on the story um, because that's, that's, where, that's where my heart is at. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it is, it, you never know, right? What, how it's going to um, echo or reverberate. And, and, you know, once you've put it out into the world, people receive it uh, through their own lens. And now right. we have this kind of collective conversation that's happening. And I guess in, in retrospect, if we're even in retrospect yet, or in the middle of like, <laughs> I, never know. Yeah. There, I, I yeah. don't know where we are. I'm right. like completely. And I think, uh, yeah, anyway. Um, yeah. I'm just curious, like, are there parts of the conversation that's happening collectively that you consider in the book and either say, wow, I wish what's in my story, what I'm dealing with were part of a larger conversation or what's in that larger conversation? Like, hmm, interesting. Maybe I'll cover this in in a follow-up of some kind, or uh, I'm just curious. Uh, oh, yeah, that's, a good, that's, question. Question. that's a good question. Yeah, uh, I mean, I am I love soapy drama deliciousness, and so I completely understand when people want to focus on those little tiny moments in my book, but I can't help as a person wish that people had the same energy in the moment in the book for when, you know, someone says the wrong thing as they do for the fact that a young woman doesn't have health insurance in this novel. And if it was during the pandemic, she would not be in a good place at all. And so I'm actually working with the Domestic Workers National Alliance and so many domestic workers like the one in my book have been out of a paycheck for so long. And so like, listen, I love any kind of juicy book. That's my favorite, but I also wish that energy was there for, for these things that really matter, yeah. Well, I, I, I don't think it's that far away. It seems like, uh, you know, this is the universal problem that you're talking about, whether it's unemployment, health insurance, income inequality, which is kind of this larger weather pattern that's also kind of uh, looming uh, that um, feels like it's about to come to roost. Uh, you, the book covers that as well. Like, is it about class um, oh, yeah. dynamics and, I and inequality? Feel so strongly that as soon as you're talking about race without talking about class inequality, it's, it's totally a moot point because I think that they inform each other so much. And so, and I also think the challenge of being an artist and making a gripping story that people want to do page turniness, but also including all of those things in their actuality, I think it's so important and everyone should really, every writer should depict those things as well as they can. Um, when I was in grad school, I took Paul Harding's workshop with this novel he wrote tinkers and he's amazing and something that he said has really stuck with me which is you know as a storyteller your job it almost isn't to tell a great story it's almost just to explain things so accurately that it's haunting and it doesn't leave people and so that scariness of walking around not having health insurance and being like okay if I get hit by a car right now, like my life is over, even though it's not my fault. I have felt that my characters have felt that. And so I hope that I explained it in a way that that is haunting and, and really and really realistic. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. I mean, again, it's uh, it just sounds like an ideal um, place to 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 approach the work um, from from that uh, rather than outside in just kind of yeah. inside out and find something that um, would resonate with just a person um, and go from there. What you know, the human experience is like in 2015 or 2020 or whatever it might be. Right, that's the um, goal always. My yeah. favorite in a book or movie or any art is that really fine line between funny, sad a little bit. So, and that's what I try and achieve for sure. Yeah. Oh, good, good. Well, my yeah, I have like a bit of a gallows humor. I'm like, I find humor in these kind of very strange situations, but it has to be built right. You know, like if it just feels like it's going for the gag or I'm sorry, I'm approaching it from like screenplays and, oh, and course, films. Yeah. Like, you're not writing for that way. But uh, when I, uh, yeah, when I, when I come across work um, that's well, well constructed, well thought out, um, 
feeling like um, it can just shock you and surprise you is uh, some of my my favorite experiences. Those are the best moments, yeah, for sure. Way. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, I guess um, getting to the library, because that's obviously who we are, um, do you have any experiences in the NYPL you'd like to share? Any fond memories uh, of being in the, the New York Public Library? I was definitely in the New York Public Library babysitting. When I was a nanny in New York City, um, I would take the two-year-old that I was babysitting for there and we would play in the computer room. We would watch the actors do little songs and, and dances and whatnot. And I mean, I feel like every nanny is just so thankful for those moments and you can just sit there and like let someone else kind of take the charge of the kid, which is great. Um, it's definitely just like a place like, I mean, I was in my 20s and whenever you're there, you're like, oh, I'm really, I actually live in New York City. This is great, uh, which yeah. is kind of nice. And I wrote a lot of this novel in the public library in Arkansas. It's just, I, I felt like when I moved away from New York City, I missed the subway and being able to see different kinds of people all the time and like in the library too and public libraries just have this way of, of presenting themselves to everyone and yeah that's that's one of my favorite places for sure do you have like one of your early memories you talk about babysitting but have you had you been babysat or with your parents or someone siblings and um in in a library that you kind of have one of those moments this is so funny. I've never been, ba I've never had a babysitter, which is kind of funny. Um, yeah, yeah I've never had one. Um, but I definitely went to the library in Tucson, Arizona, where I grew up. And I think that, I don't know if it's just children. I think that it's just like a universal thing where you just like feeling hidden and like in between stacks is a really good place to have your own thoughts. And my parents were definitely the kind of parents who didn't want us to do anything by ourselves. And so the library was great because I could feel alone without being alone. Yeah, all those pages in between us. That's great. That's really great. And um, uh, at what point did you feel, I, I know we only have probably a few more minutes, but um, at what point did you kind of discover writing as, a, as an outlet. It, you talked about, you know, not having alone time and yet here you are as a writer, right. <laughs> uh, you know, carving out all that great alone time. So like, was there a moment in your childhood where you're like, I just love doing this and I could see myself doing it for the long haul? Uh, I, I've been keeping this a little bit. I thought I wanted to act as well. I thought that hey. I loved, I know, I, I loved storytelling so much and I thought that acting was that pathway that I wanted. And I love dialogue. There's a lot of dialogue in my novel and I would write monologues and things. And I thought that that was the path that I was going on. Um, and then when I was 22, maybe I booked a commercial and I was like, this is it. This is going to change my life. This is going to be amazing. And I shot it and I hated it. And I just wanted to be writing so much more because I wrote in private, but, and I just thought it was a hobby. And so that was really a, opening moment to say like, okay, well, if you'd be rather telling stories this way, maybe you can gravitate towards that a little bit more. And so of course it took years of, I was a receptionist and I was a nanny and just writing on the side. Um, but I would say understanding that I wanted to be the one crafting the stories rather than being a vessel, which is also a terribly hard job. Yeah. Understanding that was a big game changer. Well, yeah. I mean, and, and was it from the very beginning you'd say it's a novel or did you start maybe considering short stories, journalism, um, screenplays? Love, it was always a novel. I love books. I love books so much. Yeah. yeah, it's always a novel. But I have had experiences where I start writing a short story and it wasn't working and I traded it to a play, uh, which was performed at the University of Iowa last year, which was great. So I oh my love... God, what's it called? What's it called? Oh, it's called... It's called All Astronauts Are Quiet and Sad. It's a little short, <laughs> short one act play. I am going to have to look that one up. But, All Astronauts Are Quiet yeah. and Sad. That's it. But okay. I, I think like, I, I was talking to my friend who's a poet about the, poet the other day about this. I wish that the genres would cross over a little bit more because there's so many times where I see a play or read a poem and I'm like, okay, what's the novel version of that? Like, how do we get that feeling in this other medium? And so, yeah, I definitely still appreciate acting in theater a lot. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, uh, I have a, a sort of somewhat of a handle on like the older, um, the older days, the golden age of Hollywood and things like that. But yeah, so much of the lifeblood of early Hollywood were plays and novels. Mm -hmm. Like that was, um, you know, people would would devour a novel and then they'd want to see it adapted for the screen. And and now I feel like in a way it's with long form storytelling on streaming and cable, it almost lends itself to a, a, a very faithful adaptation to, right. to these novels. So, and you also, from what I understand, you act, you have sold the rights to the, uh, you've entered into a deal um, right. with Lena, Lena White. 
with Winnie Wake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So right. with right. her, no, you're fine. Uh, her production company, Hillman Grad, has partnered with another production company called Sight Unseen. And so they have the rights and I'll be executive producing. But I'm really excited to let the experts do what they will with this novel. I know my favorite film adaptations aren't exactly like the book. And so I just really want to honor the medium and also see like, you know, the awkward moments in the book, how can we make them come to life on screen? And yeah, I'm really excited. Very cool. So you do feel like you're going to be a bit of a, um, a shadowing the process along the I way for your own Oh well? yeah, I love film so much. So I'll definitely be shadowing and, and hopefully uh, picking up some notes. Yeah. Congratulations. It's Thank you. Just wonderful. And um, well, best of luck with all this and uh, congratulations on the nomination and all the other accolades that the book has been getting and, uh, thank you. and really thank you for your time. Yeah, uh, this has been lovely. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks, Kylie. Take care.